Uh, welcome to getting towards the end of the, of the show. Uh, I'm Alice Democrat and I do tech support and training for Western Australia. Um, we're going to have a little bit of a change to the um, program. We are missing a speaker. So the uh, lot pads isn't going to be happening. So what we'll do is I'll, I'll do my session and then uh, at the end of my session we'll actually get all of the uh, tech support, the, the uh, design tech support and uh, training people down the front here and we'll have a Q&A specific, bleh, put my teeth in, specifically for the design side of things. Um, so with my sessions today, they're, they're basically covering things that have been in there for a while. We, we made a concerted effort at the last, uh, the last one was a conference, this one's a, a tech forum, uh, that we have people that come along that aren't, aren't the gun users right at the very top end of town every time. So we're going back to having a look at some of the, some of the older tools that have been in there um, and just trying to see if we can upskill people a little bit on those things now. One of the things that I always say when I start a training course is that the 12D is just a big toolbox. And what you do is you go into the toolbox and you take out whether you need the jeweler's screwdriver or you need the hammer. Sometimes you start with the jeweler's screwdriver and end up with the hammer, I guess. Um, but you just basically look at the tools that are in there and use them the way you want them. So with um, the lot pads thing, uh, Pete Tainton's done some, oh, is Pete in here? I've started saying he's done good stuff. Shouldn't have said that, because now when you go up the back there, you'll be all teary and give me a hug and a pat on the back and so on. So uh, Pete's done some, some good, um, two sets of, of good videos on lot pads, so I thought I didn't want to just rehash that exactly as it was. So I thought that we'd, I'd have a look at some other ideas as to how we might go ahead and, and use, um, use the system inside uh, 12D. So. so what I've got in here, um, I've got a, just a, a simple rectangle in here, and I don't know if you can see it or not. I've, I've got a, a contour running through the middle there that's in a different color, and it's in a broken line style. So the idea is that we're going to have a, a rectangular lot pad in here, um, and we can then go and do some cut and fill from that and, and so on. So it's basically going to be partially in cut. This is the uphill side um, over here, and then in, in fill down on this, this side here. So just um, across to the building pad itself, uh, in perspective there, you can see that what we'll end up with is, is uh, just something like that. So what I'm going to do just for the moment is I'll, I'll just remove the, uh, the, the contours and uh, we'll go in and say, take that as, as a lot pad. Now I've, I've got my, my little pads uh, icons up here. Those of course do also come from your uh, design, pads, and then the uh, create and edit pads. Now we're not using the create portion here because we've actually already got just a, a simple super string. So you don't have to use the create portion as shown in the videos where you're going to go and, and pick the, the boundaries and so on. Uh, one other thing that I just wanted to mention while I think of it, I was talking about toolbars throughout the, uh, the, the course. I don't know why I did that. Wasn't playing nice. Um, throughout the, the course of the of the conference, the, the tech forum, we've had uh, people with the with the recalc panel up here. Just to make you aware that there is also a set of icons which you can use. Purely the, the reason for that then is that you don't have to have your whole screen, you know, blocked up by that that other option. So we'll probably use that one a little bit later on. And here's my pads one. So um, coming back in here. I'm just going to go straight into edit the pad and I'll come into here and purely by going in and picking the grading option here, uh, I can set my, my text size and stuff like that in here, so purely by going and using the grading option, as soon as I want to go and put a level on there, something like that, it'll actually go through and create it into the, the style that we, we all know and I've got a height snap on there so that's come up with the with the the new level on there, 65, and I'll go and accept that. And there we are, you can see that we've just come through and we've got a, a flat pad, and that's showing up reasonably well, all those colors, yep. So um, we've got a flat pad in there, based at 65 all the way around. So if I then wanted to go through and uh, grade that in one form or another, obviously with the surface grading, um, by coming from A point 
and dragging out through the angle I wanted to go to, and then putting a slope in there of, say, 1 in minus 100, so it'll fall away from the point that I've gone to, and then dragging out the, the little circle out there, then basically when I accept that, when I accept that, come on. You guys are having the same problem with this earlier, weren't you? Don't know what's going on there. Try it again. Got it eventually. It eventually got there. So basically, if I now came and contoured that, we'd actually see the contours be running down at a, a grade right the way through there. And if we wanted to go and add extra points in here and just regrade it back, so we might want to have a crest through there and grade it 1 in 100 that way, 1 in 50 this way, whatever it is, we can just go and do those tools in there. So now that I've gone and decided that that's done, I'm, I'm going to be finished with the, the, gr the grading for the moment. And another one of the tools that's really, really useful that we, we teach all the time in, in training, again, some of those that, that have, uh, have, have trained in-house may not have used this at all, but it's a really useful little tool just to go in and use the dynamic uh, pad, which is very similar to using the, the option from the, uh, from the design, apply, and interface. The difference is that as you run it, it actually goes through and tins it all up for you and gives you volumes, and then you can, you can float the, the job up and down. So I'm going to say that we want to see this happen in our view that we're in at the moment, which is the... Uh, the building pad. I'll put those uh, contours back on again so you can just see the, the ground model looking like that. And then we can go through and say we want to have a, a cut slope of 1 and 1.5, fill slope of 1 and 2. We'll run a section separation there of every 5 meters. Search distance to try and find the ground. If it doesn't find the ground at 1 and 1.5 within 100 meters, you probably want to reassess your design or you who knows what you're doing to it. And then it's just a matter of going, deciding whether you're going to go on the left or the right. So um, I'll show you in a moment that if you, if you do choose it the wrong way around, it doesn't really truly matter. You can just go back and, and flick it back because this is actually um, just going to keep it open there for me and I can, I can swap it through. So I'm going to go and put this in, interface it back to my survey. For the moment, I'll leave the height increment at uh, zero. The model for my for my interface, I'm going to call that uh, build pad int. And that should have been uppercase, never mind, I'll change it for the next session. And then this one here, I'm going to call that build pad sects. I then go through and pick the string that I want to interface to. And when I hit process, basically what this is going to do is it's going to run through, and it's gone and produced a tin of that, so it's interfaced back to my, to my uh, pad, um, to my ground model at least, and it's gone and created a tin for me, and it's given me my, my, my uh, values in here for the volumes that I've created in there. So again, in the, in the uh, perspective view here, if we just go in and add in our um, build pad pad and, and sections, and then we can also go and add our tin to that as well. And I can't remember what I called it, build, build pad. Can I? It's already on in there, that's why, because that's why I couldn't see it. Now, if I'd got that the wrong way around and I'd gone and chosen to put it on the right-hand side, um, what I would have actually done is I would have ended up with a swimming pool which isn't really what I wanted to do. So if, the idea is that if you've, if you've drawn your string in a clockwise direction, you'd normally want to put your interface on the left. If you've drawn it on in an anti-clockwise direction, you'd go and put it in on the right. So I'll just go and process that again. There are my volumes in there. So we can see at the moment that's not too bad a, a, a balance in there. Um, I'm only out by, what, 11,000, something like that. So if I then just go through, and I've, I've sort of guessed what I was going to put it in here. So if I then come into here and go and put in a, a raise that by two meters and process that, that's actually moved the original string that my building pad was on, lifted it up by two meters, rerun the job for me, 
and it's gone and given me a new volume there. So I can go and hit process again, and so on and so forth, and you'll see that it's lifting it up, dropping it down, and I can then get it to a stage where um, I can decide that I'm, I'm happy with my design or not, as the case may be. So there we are, I've got to about 5,100, so I'm a little bit light on, on, uh, on cut there. So my height increment, I could go back to minus uh, 0.5, so I can drop it back down again, process it there, and that's then given me a, a reasonably good balance so that I can uh, have a little bit of meat left over at the end of the day. So really, that's just two simple tools we've put together there just to show you that you can, you can very quickly uh, go through. You can grade your pad um, simply, and then once you're happy with the grading, you can go through and get an, an idea of, of the, the elevation it needs to be at to give you a balance. Of course, not all jobs are, are whether you've got the, the, the ability to get a balance. Sometimes you're stuck with a pad being in a certain place, be that as it may. Um, it, it'll you know, sort of perhaps uh, work for you sometimes, and other times it won't. Now, another thing that I wanted to do then was just to come in here. So we're finished with our, with our, our building pad there. But what I thought I might do is just come into here, and, and I'll go and put in um, a string. And I'll go and put that into a model. Uh, we'll call it um, string one, if I can type it correctly. And all I'm going to do here now is I'm going to come through and go and put in a line string. And I'm going to go from, from a point here down to a point over there, down to a point over here, putting a lot of, a lot of effort into this and deciding where I'm going to go. So that might be my, my points that I'm going to go to. So now what I may want to do is, is to go through here, and those are on another model, actually, which just snuck itself in there. Not supposed to be there. Um, so what I can do in here now is just come into my uh, editor pad. And again, I'm not saying that this is the way you'll ultimately do this. I'm just showing you some ideas of what you might work. You may well decide that instead of doing what I'm about to do here, you may go and put in a, a, a super alignment string. But by just coming into here and um, selecting my string and accepting it, I've immediately gone and set it up with colors and levels on each of them. I can then decide, well, what do I want to do with that now? I might decide that I want to go through and grade that string. So simply by coming in here, picking with direction along the string there, and going and saying that I want that to be at minus uh, 75. It's gone and graded that down to my next level here, changed that one for me. Grade this one through here to one in minus 100, and then through to this one here, where I may go, it's looking a little bit flatter, so I may go at, say, 1 in minus 200 or something like that. And basically, I've just gone and developed that string, showing me the levels that I've got at each point, and showing me the grades at each of those points along there as, as, a, as a 1 in something or other. So as I said, you may well decide that you're going to go and do that with a, a super alignment string. And it's a toolbox, so you go and select the tool you want to use, and if it suits you to use that one, then that's fine, use it. The other thing that you might have decided to do instead of what I've just done there is you might decide you've, you've gone and put it all in, and instead of wanting to see those, le those levels showing like that, you could, of course, come up to your, to your leaders, and you could go and get a, a string Z for a particular point. And I just chose the contour then by mistake, so... But anyway, you can see what I'm getting at. Um, or I might decide that I'm going to go with my CAD leaders and go and put a, a string grade of one in to this point here. So again, it's just purely a matter of looking at the tools that we've got and selecting a tool that suits you for a particular cause. Right, so the next thing that I wanted to move on to then is to have a look at a situation like this where we've got a, a car park. Now, with a, we're talking probably about a, a, a car park in a, in a shopping centre. They haven't built the shopping centre yet. They've just put the car park in there. They're, they're early, early development thinking. Um, so they've gone and put their, their car park in there. And basically what, again, we might decide that we 
it's all set out spatially. We know exactly where it's going to go. Um, and then what we would want to then do is to change the order of my views, which some of them seem to have disappeared. Hmm. Oh, well. Um, I don't know how that happened. I, I'm sure I, I can't even find anyone to blame here because I'm the only one that's up here. Um, so the idea is then that, that what we could do is if I just remove my, my tin from there, The idea is that that really didn't work very well. There's got to be a, a, a view here somewhere. It's disappeared. It's totally disappeared. Okay. Go and make a new view and put the stuff in there. Not what I wanted to do. So in my, my new view there, I'm going to go and put in my uh, alignment for the car park edge and uh, some of my car park islands. And my tadpoles. Bugger. Okay, so there we are. And then I've got some, some gullies that I've, I've put into here as well. So I think I call them construction points, car park construction. Uh, basically, I've in somewhere in here, gully points maybe. Hmm. I've lost about four views there, so it's going to make it interesting for the rest of the job. Okay, that'll do it. And then there was something that was called uh, gully something or other, I believe. Gully test levels. So what I've done in here is I've gone through and put in some, some strings that I'm going to use as, as grading for my, for my gullies. Um, and I'm going to go and put in a couple more as well. So I'll just go and use my, my uh, um, eyedropper here. And really all I'm then doing is going into here, and I'll come into the alignment string, go and pick a point over here that I want to come from. Drag out to over there. Do similar again from this corner over here. Out to there. So you can see basically what I'm doing is just going through and putting in some points that will give me a guide for a bit of, of where I might decide my, my drainages. Because what I'm actually going to be doing here in a moment is going through and having a look at what might be a suitable height to put my gullies in so that they'll drain properly. So now that I've got those points in there, I can come back up here to my, to my uh, allotment grading tool. I can come through here and say, right, I want to come through and grade from this point heading out towards my gully there. And I'm going to go with a slope of 1 and say minus uh, 50, which would be probably m the minimum I'd want to go to. So you can see that's going to go and give me a, 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 an ele elevation down there of about 36.63. I'll go on this one here, and I'll go and put that in and say a 1 and minus 100 and see what I can get to. Now, those two are overlapping one another. We'll, see, we'll, we'll sort them out in a minute. Um, by changing the textile. This one here, we might decide is going to be 1 and again 200, whatever it might be. We'll go back to our 1 and minus 50. And so basically, we can come through here and decide what level is going to be suitable as a minimum and a maximum to go and create, create this gully to. So by ta uh, putting on my, my z values down there, um, I've got in there a 36.6. 3, 36.96, 36.75, 36.75. So the idea is I can then look at that and say, well, I've got to have a, a suitable grade that's going to give me the best drainage I can possibly get 
without pushing it too low or keeping it too high. So then it would purely be a matter of coming into here and saying, right, so I now want to go, and let's just say I'd go and choose, what have we got? We'll go down to the, uh, to the minimum one. So we'll go to 36.63. So if I come and pick on this point here, put on a height there, 36.63. This one here, 36.63. Same over here. Basically now, if I then just go and uh, finish that, and I'll just go and toggle off my, my text on that. What I've done is, and we do the same for these other ones in here, we go and have a look at them as, as, a, as a, a minimum, maximum. The idea now is that if I then just come through and include those into my triangulation, I should then get a triangulation which, which is going to give me my contouring around there, knowing that I'm going to grade it down to those points. So I've got the tin in here already. I hope. I had views as well, and they disappeared. So who knows what's going to happen? Uh, what is my tin called? This should be car park. Tin car park, look, there we are, tin car park surface. So at the moment, you can see that there's, there's nothing in there. Uh, if I then bring a, a go and get my, my tins, I think I've got a, hmm. I thought I had a, a layout for that, but we'll go into here, we'll go and edit the tin. which is my tin car park surface. With our data in there, we'll come in and go and add in our model of the test levels, triangulate that and put the, the tin contours on. So basically, change that interval. This was all set up in my views, and I should have saved them away as a, as a view favorite. So there's a lesson there for, for you folks, isn't there? Lesson that you should go and use your view settings to go and save your work nicely. And I, of all people, should know that. Go to 0 0.1 and... Change those colors so they're a little bit more friendly for the, rather than the greens and reds, which colorblind folk don't like. So that's now showing me that we, what we've got is that's a, that's a, a 10 millimeter gradient along there. So basically that's gone show, and pulled it down and shown me that we can actually set it down into to whatever level we decide is going to be the go for our drainage based on our minimum and maximum criteria to that point. Okay, so the next one. This job, what I'm looking at here again is again still using the same tool for our, for our drainage, at least for our, our, our lots grading. Um, what I did in, in a job a few years ago as a, on a real job was I had a uh, a situation where there was there was a there was a, a, a bridge abutment. Uh, so I didn't have a bridge abutment here. So I'm just going to pretend that the hill is my bridge abutment. And the idea was that there was a bridge abutment coming in here, and this, there was a cycleway that came up and around the side here, and basically that then was going to be set up to a different different height. And they wanted to excavate all of the all of the material from down in here. So what actually happened was that there was a, an overload of, of, the, uh, of, of the, the dirt over a paleo channel. So the bridge was actually starting to settle a little bit, and they wanted to lighten the whole area up. So the idea is that I've, I was going to go through and have the cycleway th coming along here. So I should have a, a string that's going to give me the cycle, the full alignment for the cycle path. 
And there we go, that's going to be running all the way up and around through there. And as I said, it's a bit of a bugger that all those views are gone because they were all set up to show exactly every element that I wanted. So we'll come back to a, a long section view here, which isn't at all the job that I wanted to show you. That's set up for another one, but we'll still use it anyway. Um, and the idea was that this, this alignment string is following up the edge of the embankment um, with some fairly steep grades and so on, which obviously for a, for a cycleway are not suitable. Um, but as I said, it's just to show, show the, the general idea in here. Um, now, what we then wanted to do was to go through and have our path uh, shown in here. So I'll go and put my cross sections for my path. Hmm. Bear with me a second. I'm just wondering if this is actually a different job, because there's, there's... No, that's the one, so I don't know why it's rolled back. Did I? Ah. Yeah. I'm hoping that I haven't got auto-save on here. So that was what, what, what happened when it was... Uh, mm. So I'm glad someone noticed it, because I didn't. Oh, I got some of them back. Mm, nope. Oh. I don't know. Look, I'm just going to have to wing it from here. So the idea was with, uh, with my... Uh, Uh, I'll go and create a, a perspective view. And I'll go and put in my alignment for the, for the path. Um, and hopefully I've still got my, my functions there, so that should hopefully work. Design path, that one there, and the cross sections for the path. RS path, cross sections, RS path, that one. Yay, finally getting there. Okay, so at the moment this is just, just sitting there climbing its way up. Now I've run a, I've run a, a little uh, job on it here where I've actually gone and put in a, a little retaining wall up through here, but on the inner, inner side there, the idea is that we're going to try and hack out this corner here. So, um, with my tin at the moment, with my tin at the moment, you can see what we've done is we've just made that disappear into the ground over there. So what I then wanted to do was come back. All is forgiven. Come back. What I then wanted to do was to actually come through and in my, in my plan view for my um, path, which I've now wiped out because I went and restarted the job, um, not going well, is it? Not going at all well. Fortunately, we don't have another speaker, so I can waste as much time as I need to here. It's not as boring for you guys, but oh dear. Uh, so we'll just call it view two. Um, and in here, the idea was that if you think back to it, of we've got our, um, our alignment for the path running along there. And then what I've done is I've actually gone and got a job here, a model that's called construction wall base.
And the construction wall base string is actually one of the strings that's been taken from the edge of my path. But at the moment, it's up high in the air here. So the idea is that what I then wanted to do was to come in here and use the, um, the path to grade that. So what I'll do is I'm going to come into here and just setting my string the same as that. I'll then go through here, and I'm going to use a, a uh, points edit, come through, pick on the end of that string there, come out to a point that I've got there. I've just got a level on there as a guide to myself to see what's going on. This then runs across the front of the job, and then I'll go through and close that string off. So at the moment, um, all of the existing part that ran up here is at the height that we, we didn't really want it at, which is the top of the, of the, of the, uh, of the, of the cycleway. So I'm going to go and remove the actual cycle alignment string now. And then what we're going to do is use the pads option here come through, use the grading, and I'm going to use that surface grading. Now, normally we see surface grading happening on a rectangle or something like that, whereas this is a, a very odd shape, and it actually folds back on itself. So if I then come into here, and I say that I want to have this point here, and I'm going to grade it out through over here. At the moment, I just remember that this is at a null height, so I'm going to cancel that just to add to my confusion and horror up here. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to come through and put a level on this point here. And that level is going to be, instead of being a null, is going to be the 22.847. So that's gone and graded the whole of that lot. This one up here, I'll put a height on that of the 23. 0.871. So now that that's actually graded, I'm going to come through here, put my surface grading on from this point. I want to grade it up in this direction, so even though I'm not actually passing through any of the points on that string itself, um, I'm going to grade that up at, say, 1 in 100. Drag it through here, and this is where we, we had the problem before, isn't it, where it wasn't accepting it. So hopefully this time it's Don't know why this is suddenly playing up. And that now should then, with a little bit of luck, have come through here. And if I toggle my shading off, and go and add my construction wall base string. It's now sitting, although it's, it's multicolored, it's actually sitting down the bottom here. So what I can then, if I just zoom in a little bit on this so you can see it, it's taken the height of the string back at this point here, and it's graded it through at 1 and 100, so you can see it's actually coming through at a lower level for this, this shot through there. So now that I've got that, I can then run through, create a new tin for, for that, which I believe I already have a tin there. So I'll just go and switch it on. And that's going to be a tin um, tin base of retaining wall path, tin. beast there. So that's sitting down there. So now all I need to do to, to complete this lot is actually to come back in, edit my strings through here. And on the left side, I've got a, a few modifiers that have, that have been run through here that are already switched off. Um, so what I've got in, in there is I've created the path itself, created a little hand wall, a handrail along there, and then I've got adjust the tune to the base. So I'm extending the retaining wall down to meet the new tin. 
I am removing the final uh, links in that portion, adjusting the final batter at the start and the end. The critical one there was actually this, this first one here. So when I go through now and apply that, what should actually happen is instead of the uh, tin itself sticking, uh, shading on, instead of the tin itself, as it was shown here originally sitting way up there, when I go and add that new uh, tin to my uh, super tin, and I update that, then what we've gotten there, hmm. I've got the other tin on the top of it. And recalc, you know, I should have done the, there you go, thank you very much. Basically what that's done is that's gone through and tidied that up so that you can see my, um, My wall is coming along through there. Basically, it's on the upper stream. It's going through there and cutting into the to the thing on the on the upside side of the hill, and then on the downside here, it's come down and met this this portion that I've cut out. So that I've got that retaining wall coming all the way down there. So we can finish now. Thank you. So the last one that I wanted to then show you here is, looks like we do have still have these models, hopefully. Yep. The uh, last one that I wanted to show you here was, uh, again, for in Western Australia with the, the Water Corporation over there, they have, uh, in any of their, um, of their um, uh, water treatment plants, they have these drying ponds. And the drying ponds are normally set out fairly specifically, so they've got an exact height um, rise from the, from the primary to the secondary to the, to the final um, drying ponds, and the idea is that there's a, a set height between them, set distance between them, so they can get uh, their bobcats in, tidy out all the, all the slurry and stuff that's in there, and there's a, a, a finite uh, height between each of these so that the idea is that they will um, be able to get the water to, to drain properly from, from, the, from the primaries right down to, to, the, uh, to the finals. Now, this is a, another portion of, the, of, of, of a thing that Pete Tainton wrote, which is actually to use the dynamic pad pond. And Pete has done a couple of little videos of this, and, and perhaps not quite as, as complex a set of strings as I've got in here. So I've already got a function for this one, which I'll, I'll go and fill in. And the idea is that with this, instead of just having the, the dynamic pad where I lifted one pad up and down, um, you can actually use this to, to move a whole set of strings together. So all of the strings that are inside this off yellow string here, so all of the off yellow itself and all of the orange strings, those will all move as one element when I decide to go and, and move this. And so what I'm doing is I'm saying I want to, and to interface this um, with a cut slope of 1 and 2.5, fill slope of 1 and 2.5, uh, cut sections at 5 meter intervals. I'm going to interface that back down to my survey um, tin. And then my internal model, as I said, that's all of the off yellow and orange strings. So it's going to move those as one element, if you like. Um, the interface string is going to be the brown string around the outer edge there. So. What I can then do is I can come down here, I can choose my reference string that I want, and go and process that. That then gives me my volumes in there, and again, with the, with the view that was supposed to be there, my pond string should have switched on. What did I call them? I'll go and find the tin for it then. Tin pond. Can anyone see a tin pond there? 
That one. That's the one. So basically what that's done is that's gone through and produced the ponds for me. Um, you can see there that it's all matched up nicely. And my volume's in here again. I'm, I'm way f uh, too far down on my, uh, on my, my volumes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and, and lift these, um, making sure that I tick my maintain height increment. And my height increment, I'm going to go 0 0.5. And I process that. That's then going to run through there, lift it up by half a meter. So my volumes are a little bit better. Process it again by half a meter. And my volumes, you can see, are increasing and increasing each time I go through. So really, by having all of those strings included in there, it's not just the one string that we're doing with the dynamic pad where we can lift that one up and down. Um, it's actually just going to be a whole set of strings inside um, a model that can be floated up and down together regardless of their relationship to one another and then an interface off to the side of that. And then it's just purely a matter of, uh, of lifting that or dropping it until you get your volumes that you were after. So that was the, the disaster known as pads and ponds. Um, we'll try and do a little bit better with the next, the next couple of things. How am I going for time? Look, I'm doing quite well on wasting time, so that's quite good. Um, on to the next portion. So, this is where we wanted to go. So, again, when it comes to uh, come on, slideshow, let's have you from the beginning. Now, so you're awake. All right. Resume slideshow. I don't know. I guess we're not having it in the slideshow mode. We'll go with that mode then. Um, again, folks, when it comes down to, to talking about track and so on, um, there are already a set of, of eight track tools which um, you can either look, view as independent, uh, probably 10 minute or so videos, or there are two half hour videos which show all the track tools. Now, I was gonna say we don't have any new track tools in here, but we do have one new track tool which we'll show at the, at the end of the session. Um, but rather than going through and, and just trying to show those tools that we've already got videos on, uh, which we couldn't do in, in the, the 15 minutes or so that I had anyway, I thought that we'd actually run through and have a look at, at some of the uh, demystifying the, the tools. So I'll just try once more to get my slideshow for, to work from the beginning, and it's not happening. Okay, so we'll just go with, with this mode then. Um, so a simple guide to track terminology. So rail design is not that different from road design. Um, and a competent road designer will easily switch to rail design with the guidance of a rail engineer or an experienced rail designer. Uh, even I managed to do it. So some description of commonly used terms in here. As per highway design, railway uses horizontal transitions and, at the, and the start and end of curves. Trains generally have fixed axles, so the transition eases them into the curve, and the type of transition may vary different uh, countries and, and states for heavy, light, rail, heavy rail, and, and obviously high speed as well. You don't want trains that are traveling at, at high speed. Some of the, the uh, European, Japanese, and, and so on trains that are hurtling along at high speeds, they've got to be very, very carefully designed, so their transitions are, are critical for them. So looking at a typical cross-section of, the, of the, the screen, you've basically got uh, your two rails sitting up there on top of uh, pandrel plates, which then sit on your sleeper, which is sitting on ballast, which, unlike roads, is obviously just a, it's a, it's a pile of stones that is basically uh, absorbing the impact of, of the train running over the top of it, so it, you, it's not, you know, sort of harsh and going to crack and, and so on. On top of that, you've got a capping level and then uh, your formation below there. So really, when you're running your first run of, of a train, you, your, your critical parts are you're going to get your formation and your capping done because that's going to be your bulk earthworks, and there's a, an unknown quantity of cost in that. For, for the rest of it, everything above the capping layer, it is a, a per meter run of cost for your ballast, for your sleepers, uh, and for your rails. So that's 
going to be the same no matter what you do virtually. It's your earthworks, your formation, and capping that'll make the difference. You then have the gauge. Um, so the gauge is the distance from the top of the inner edge of the left rail to the top of the inner edge of the right rail. And gauges vary from country to country, and in Australia, from state to state. Now, the gauges huge, vary hugely from 600 millimeters to 2,140 millimeters. And there are common designations, a narrow gauge, which is, again, commonly, not always, but commonly 1067, standard, which is around about uh, 1435, and broad gauge. So we'll talk about the, the, the localities of where these might be, and then we'll say why we have them. So narrow gauge is commonly used in Western Australia, Queensland, Tasmania, New South Wales, and South Africa. But of course, there are sites within each of those regions as well that may use other gauges. Uh, there's a meter gauge, which is a, a, a 1,000 millimeters, obviously, and it's included in this set, and, and it is or was used by colonial European powers, British, French, German, across Europe, Africa, plus Malaysia and Thailand. And then there's a standard gauge, which is probably the most common gauge worldwide. Uh, then you've got broad gauge, which is, is used in the Indian subcontinent and parts of the USA. Now, why do we have the different gauges? Well, I guess, first of all, it depends what you're trying to move on the trains and, uh, and, and why you're going to go through with each of those, because the um, size of the, of, the, of the gauge itself means that you've got less cost in laying down the rails. You can also lay them quite quickly. And in fact, that was a, a situation uh, during the First and Second World War where they were actually using very small track gauges uh, on behind, uh, behind the lines in, in um, their sort of areas of conflict. So they could actually get munitions and food and stuff like that up quickly. And the, they could actually carry these, these little light bits of rail and plonk them down. And they could, they could put kilometers of them in in a day, get a train to where they needed to go, and then get munitions in there. And then if they needed to move them on, they could lift them quickly and move them. So you've got those. You've obviously then got things like you, you're going to be moving people around in, in Western Australia, we've got three probably three tiers of, of rail. You've got your people moving stuff, which is generally in the cities and so on. We've then got a, a large network that's that's going to be carrying all the all the grain from the wheat belt into into the um, the, the depots to be sent sent off to the Fremantle Port, and then you've got the the very heavy rail, which is for for uh, the iron ore up 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 north. And of course, the bigger your gauge the more expensive it is, but also the longer it's going to last. So this, these are the sort of things that, uh, that, that, they, that, that make you decide what gauge you're going to be running. Now, as I said, the locations are merely a bit of a guide, and most likely there'll be more than one gauge used in the majority of them. Um, there are other gauges as well that I haven't mentioned. Uh, there can be a problem uh, with single location using more than one gauge because the rolling stock, the locos, the wagons, carriages, etc., will need to be changed. And an example of this is Western Australia, which uses narrow and standard gauge. Uh, the reason for that is that for many years uh, at Kalgoorlie, trains had to change, be unloaded from the eastern states, which were running standard gauge, and then were loaded onto narrow gauge trains, which of course is very time consuming and a pain in the butt for the people that had to do it as well. So what was the solution to that? Well, then we suddenly end up with, with a dual gauge track where they actually will lay three rails so you can run either your narrow gauge or your standard gauge over the top of it. And basically that means that you're going to, uh, you, you know, you're going to save a lot of time on that. They can, they can just use one train running right the way through to the port. So for the horizontal design, uh, we normally use the, the center line of the track which is halfway between the two, trail, to the two rails, and vertically on what's termed the top of low rail, or TLR. As we go around a corner, we have what's called cant. So that's basically super elevation for rails. So that the external rail on, on a curve will actually be lifted, and the internal rail always stays at the original height, so the low height, and hence the term top of low rail. Uh, the canter is applied in much the same manner as super elevation from the center line either to the left or the right. Uh, unlike road carriageway, there's no surface between the left and right side rails, and therefore there's no break of grade uh, between them, and the, the uh, tr train will just span from one track to the other. So when I'm running a job, 
I will generally apply two functions from the center line. There'll be one that's actually done for the rails themselves. So that, that ra those rails will then have the cant applied to them so that it knows when this one's lifting, that one's dropping, and so on. And that's normally done at a later stage of the, of the design phase. As I said to you before, the, the initial thing that we want to get is the, the amount of earthworks that are going to go into there. So there'd be a separate um, formation and capping um, a function with maybe boxing, or nowadays more commonly, it'll be run as a trimesh. So we apply the formation template with a height and hinge modifier um, to suit the combined depth of the rail, the pandrel plate, sleeper, etc. So we're talking about the height from basically the top of the rail at this point here down to the bottom of the rail down there. So for a heavy rail, it might be as much as 850 mils. So inside your MTF, you'd basically go into the hinge modifier and you give it a height modifier, which means that it will drop the alignment string, which is sitting up here, down by 850 mils. And if we go and move the alignment string, well, this one will go wherever it happens to be. So you're not having two strings in there, um, which I've, I've seen people doing. So they'll go and copy the alignment string down. But that's dangerous, because if you forget to move it, well, then you're in trouble, aren't you? So then we come to intersections for rails. And the intersections are re referred to as crossovers and turnouts. The crossovers are a link between one track and another to enable the train to change lanes, which of course would line, so joke there, folks, you're allowed to laugh now. No? Not worth it. All right, fair enough. Um, the turnouts are switches um, that allow the track to go straight or turn onto another track. And the turnouts are usually designed and manufactured by specialist companies and are designated as a 1 in 10, 1 in 12, 1 in 20, which defines the turnout angle that they're going to be using. And turnouts are, are preferably placed on the straights. Um, they cost significantly less if they're on a straight, but you can place them on curves if you need to. So what we're saying there is that if you've got a curve that's turning away and you're going to turn on the inside of that, that would be a similar flexure. If you've got a curve that's turning this way and you're having a turnout going the other way, that would be a contraflexure. Now, with our turnout sets at the moment, we don't have those, so that's when you'd start to go and use element design for your super alignments. Um, the turnouts themselves are manufactured by specialist companies that do that, and they would normally give you uh, the typical turnout drawing, as I've shown you in, in that case there. So it's also highly desirable to have the turnouts on a single grade vertically, because remember that these switches are, are literally blades that are going to be moving across one another like this, or well, not across one another, but they'll be sliding together on, on a slide. And so uh, whilst it's possible to have them on a vertical curve, um, they'll be far more expensive to manufacture and they'll wear a lot more quickly than if they're on a single grade. So the two things we're saying there is obviously you've got to you want to try and keep your, your turnouts on a straight wherever possible and also on a single grade rather than having them on a vertical curve. Now the vertical curves, I mean you're normally talking about a, about a you know, sort of 3,000 meter, so 3K three, three radius vertical curve is, is quite normal for, for heavier rail anyway. Okay, so that's got to the end of that one. Um, and I think I've got a little bit more here somewhere. Right. Is this one going to work nicely for me if I go and pick on that? Oh, yes, it did. Um, so What I've done here is just a, a snippet to produce a cut and fill decisional template. Now, this has sort of fallen into the rail situation, but it doesn't have to be for that. Um, and again, if, if you were using it for rail, it would be pretty specific as to what sort of rail you would do. So what I wanted to do here was to have one snippet that uses fixed decisional templating to do all of this in one go for me. So in the fill situation um, down here, um, We've got a series of, of uh, batters and benches cut through there, for, uh, filled in through there. And as we come up into our, our cut situation here, again, we've got these, these batters and benches all within one snippet, so that it'll actually use that to, to produce the job for us. So just a couple of different views there to show you a little bit more of what's going on. So how does it work? Well, uh, all the design strings are inserted as fixed decisional modifier into the snippet, uh, or the MTF going to go that way. Uh, and this means that you can go back and modify them as you require. So for example, you can vary a drain's depth 
or modify it from a, a V drain to a trapezoidal drain by inserting an extra link and then widen it to, to, to suit. Now, with the older uh, decisional templates, when we had them, you're, you're, the, the old school users will remember that we've got those five portions of our template. So you've got the fixed portion, and then next to that you had the decisional portion. And if you went through and made a decisional template, so that was all very good. You could look for your whether you and cut, fill, how much cut, how much fill, and change your, your, your templating dependent upon that. But the problem was that you only had one bite at that, because once you'd produced that, you, could, you couldn't go back and change it because it was decisional. So what you'd have to do is if you wanted to go from having a V-drain to having a trapezoidal drain, you'd say, right, my V-drain is going to run from this point, we'll say chainage, we don't generally use chainages anymore, but from this chainage to that chainage. Then you'd have to stop and have a little gap and then use your next decisional template, which would have the tra trapezoidal drain in it. And then that little gap in between them, you'd actually go through and you'd actually have to model those up to suit. So that was always a stumbling block block prior to version 12, uh, because once you'd created the links, you, you couldn't actually do much with them. Um, so with this portion here, what we're looking at is the fill portion. So the primary um, portion could either be placed as a, by a template or as a snippet. Um, and this could be used for road or rail, whichever you wanted to do. Now, obviously, it's, not, it's going to be in a greenfield site, and you're probably talking about fairly, fairly hilly terrain where you'd be using something as complex as this. So the fill template split up into two portions. You get a shallow fill portion, which is this, this portion that's shown up um, over here, where you would basically go through and say, right, I want to define a, a height and a slope, so a height of, of how much I'm going to drop down and then basically a deep fill portion which will have batters, uh, which are again defined by height and slope, and a bench, um, which is defined by height and slope. And that fill portion down here, the deep fill portion, would be repeated as many times as was necessary until you got to the shallow fill, and then it goes into the shallow fill. And it does similar on, on the, the cut side of things. So again, down this time we're starting down here in the cut portion. So the primary surface again is going to go in as, as your um, snippet or a template. And then we'll decide, OK, we're going to put in a V-drain down the bottom there so we can define a depth and slope on that. Um, and we then start off in deep fill if we're um, shallower than the shallow fill. So the idea is here that you would say, right, within the shallow fill is going to be defined by a depth below ground level. Okay? And if you're in that level, that's fine. You just go and use the shallow depth. But if you're below that depth of ground level, so that's where we're talking about up here. I don't know if that is that little flashing icon showing up there at all. Um, if you're w beyond that depth, then it'll start going and doing these, these uh, berms and, and benches Basically, again, as many as it needs to go through to complete the ground model. So with a snippet, we usually try to keep the snippet panels as small as possible, with not too many fields in them. Now, some of the tri-mesh ones are big, and that's because they've got a lot of gear in them. However, in this one, I failed. Okay? The reason for that is that because there's a hell of a lot that's got to do, so it really is worth having the big panel. And once you've actually figured out what's going on in there, it's really just asking you about what, what uh, berms and batters you want to use. And uh, it then runs through automatically. So I know from the back that you, you wouldn't probably be able to read those settings, but it's just asking you for, for, for cuts, you know, sort of cuts of slopes and, and things like that. So, so let's just go and have a quick look at it uh, in action. So. in here somewhere. There. I'll try not to blow it away this time. Um, so what I've got in here is just, we'll just go through and, and pick our, uh, one of our strings for this job. Uh, and the idea is that the whole thing is made up purely by insert the primary surface up there so we can collapse that one. And then there's just one snippet that does all of the rest of this job along here. So if I come into here, and those are the settings that I've got. This, at the moment, they're the same on the left and the right-hand side. So we'll say that that's OK, that's fine. And if we have a look at my cross-section here, see, I've got my views this time. They didn't disappear. You can see that this is actually looking the same on both sides there. But if I then come across to my right-hand side, I could then go into here and go and change one, one or, or two of these depths. So I might go and change the V-drain or whatever it is. I'll 
probably go through and do my, my deep cut batter, and instead of it being six meters, I'll go and put it down to a, a three meter height. Um, and we'll apply that one. And that's basically all I needed to do for it to up, update my job through here. So if I just go and pull this down and I'll just move my, my eye point here a little bit. So we can see this, this bigger cutting in there. You can see that on, on this side over here, we've got a six meter section looking up there, and on this side here, we've gone and got a three meter section. So it just keeps on going through there, and what it's doing is it's putting in a safety berm at the top if you decide that you, you can put a height in there to invoke the safety berm, and then if, if you're uh, on the up, upstream side of, the, of the, the, the model, so the ground is falling towards your safety berm at the top, we've got a cutoff drain in there, but if, it's, if the ground is sloping away from it, it doesn't need the safety berm, so it doesn't bother. So the whole of that is just done with one snippet, uh, which will be available in version 14. As I said, it's, it's not the sort of thing you're going to use in an urban environment, but uh, for, for anything where you've got you know, fairly large cuts and fills, it should make quite a difference, I'm hoping. And then down below here, uh, on the right-hand side, I won't bother demoing it at the moment, but just down here, we've then got our, our normal modifiers to go and insert a drain, a, a, a extra drain link to make it a trapezoidal, and then we can go and grade it and I'll apply it, but I won't bother probably going and showing you, but really what it does, I've got many warnings in there, so it's exactly what I didn't want. Um, but basically it's now gone through and put in my trapezoidal drain running along through here. The reason it gave me a whole lot of warnings was because I, I ran it the whole way along the job, and of course I don't need a trapezoidal all the way along. But you can see basically I've gone through and I've graded that, put that in to, to give me the... Uh, the extra links that I needed in there. So that's the one new thing that I wanted to show you there. And the other one is something that uh, is new to ver version 14. So what I've got here is I've got my, my uh, two rail alignments. It could be road as well. There's no reason it has to be rail, but I was talking about rail here. So I'll just go and remove my contours from there. And basically what I'm now going to do is I'm going to go through with one of the worst version, version options which is still under testing, which is to for reverse curve fitting. So the idea is that I want to come off the end of this string here and go and put in two reverse curves with a tangent length in the middle between them. So again, I'm probably thinking you won't be able to read that that panel up the back, so I'll run through and show you what it's saying. So it's saying, which is my approach string? So I'm going to come down here, pick on this button. This is my approach string, so I pick it with direction as per normal and select that. I'm then saying I want to come from that with a 60 meter transition length. And again, you can choose your transition type, so I'm just using a, a clothoid here, uh, with an 800 meter radius arc and then a 60 meter trailing length, a tangent length in the middle of 40 meters. And then I'm going to go to this string here. So again, picking so we go in the same direction. And that's going to have a 60 meter uh, transition, a minus 800 meter radius, and then a 60 meter transition again. So when I go and hit process that, basically what it's done is it's gone through and put in this element in the middle there for me. So that's all just one element that's gone in there, which you can then, if you needed to, you could actually go and, and uh, combine that with your, with your through line. So that's one new little tool that's coming in version 14. I believe there will be others to come through the course of version 14, but um, that's all we've got at the moment. So not a lot in there for rail yet. We are actually doing quite a lot of panel, panel sorting on them. There, there were a few little um, typos and, and stuff ups in the, in the panels for the existing rail stuff, which should be tarted up. So I believe that's all I've got for you folks. So what we're going to do now is we've got a little bit of time up our sleeve. How much time? Let's have a look, see. This was supposed to go to 2.30. So um, yeah, we've got, a, we've got a little while yet. So what we'll do is we'll get all the, the design, uh, design tech, tech support guys up here, and we'll just have a little Q&A 
on, um, there's the timer going now. So we've, gone, we've run over time. Ah. Oh, well, there wasn't any tea anyway, so it didn't matter. There isn't any afternoon tea. No, that's what I'm saying. There isn't any, so it doesn't matter. So they're all going to yeah. come back into yep. this room. So, uh, so it worked all right. <laughs> Keep your seats. Don't give up your seats. The other ones are coming out. Stand up.